Hi, and you're very welcome back to the fifth episode of the League of Ireland podcast here on FinalWhistle.ie. My name is Brett Early, and I am joined once again this week by my glamorous co-host, all the way from Sligo, Alan Keane. Alan, you're very welcome back. Cheers. I don't know about glamorous now. I thought you were going to say I had hair or something, but at that stage. But <laughs> no, I'm not making a mistake. I'm safe enough. I can give you some of this though. I could, could do it getting rid of a bit. Um, I'm really liking this this vibe we're having where we alternate between yourself and Dean. It gives a really nice vibe. I think it's uh, it gives us different geographic perspective as well in, in terms of, of where we're coming from. Uh, there's so much action going on this weekend uh, after a busy, busy weekend uh, in the league across both divisions. Of course, nine games, uh, four in the Premier Division, the Shamrock Rovers Derry game postponed because of international call-ups. We might touch on the international thing for a moment, if you don't mind. Let's start there briefly. Um, disappointing, I think, weekend for Ireland. But is it a case of having to crack eggs to make an omelette further down the road? Yeah, I think so. Uh, like I always say, you have to hit rock bottom to go to get back on that ladder again. And like, you know, you've got to stick with, you got to stick with Stephen. And uh, and it, it, I find it difficult with him for, for international football. He gets players in a day, a day or two before a game and you've got to play and they're coming from the clubs. He has had a horrendous start with the, with the injuries and, and COVID and all that. I just think, got to stick, tre- test, test out the younger lads. And, uh, Look at positivity has to be. Yeah, I think somebody made the point I saw during the week where Michael O'Neill won one out of eighteen games, uh, the first eighteen games with Northern Ireland, including a defeat to Luxembourg. So if we end up as strong in another eight games as Northern Ireland did for the period Michael was with them, I'll be more than happy as a Republic of Ireland fan. So uh, the, I, I, I think we should. I agree with you. I hundred percent agree with you. I think uh, we we're looking at a legacy of poor investment of time and resources into the underage talent coming up. We've relied on England for far too long. That seems to have closed up a bit. The granny rule seems to be a thing of the past. So we've got to look at the underage leagues. And I think that's kind of, it's great to see it start. And I think we're going to see the dividends of that in time down the road. Anyway, enough about the Ireland camp. That's This is the League of Ireland show rather than an Irish international uh, team show. Um, let's start with the Premier Division results of the weekend. And I suppose two games played on Friday evening, uh, the first one of those was uh, Waterford and Sligo Rovers. Where do you start? Uh, two fantastic goals from Sligo. It had to come from behind, though, but they'll be happy with all three points in the bag. Oh, definitely. Uh, any result away from home, regarding uh, of the performance, is, is you know if you get three points away, you're 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 on a, on a run, like you know on a, on a winning buzz. But uh, for me, Jordan Gibson, again, excellent. Um, Romeo's goal, superb. But Jordan Gibson's goal, pick of the night, pick of the weekend. Um, it could be pick of the season. But uh, a, a little word for for Ed McGinty, who made a fantastic save at when the uh, Sligo Rovers were were one 0 down. He pulled off a double save. It would could have been two 0 to Waterford, and you're talking they mightn't have come away with the three points, and might have only been lucky with 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 the point. You know, so a uh, great result on the road. Yeah, they've got to be happy with that, Liam Buckley. Definitely will be. Uh, another relatively big surprise, although it kind of feels a bit um, moot saying that now about anything that happens in this division. Dundalk, Finn Harps, Oriel Park, you've got to fancy Dundalk to do their business, but Ollie had other ideas. Yeah, Ollie has Champions League uh, in his sights, you know, so <laughs> um, <laughs> as he said himself, no, I, I he won't thank the- you for that. He won't <laughs> thank you for that. I fancied uh, Finn Harps to get something, and I said it during the week. I, I just, I, I didn't, I, I didn't see them winning, but I did see them getting something, and uh, I thought they were deserving. Um, they done well. Um, Ollie's finally getting a bit of luck, um, which which is needed. But yeah, they they went up with a game plan, and they didn't sit back. They press, they pressed all over the pitch, and they got the just rewards. And John Dawker obviously on a little bit of a downward spiral and and, and a big game ahead this weekend against Sham, so they'll have to pick themselves up quickly. How much of a worry is that for Dundalk? Yes, it is. It is worry because confidence in the camp. Um, you know, you're going to the league champions now, and if they lose that, you know, Shamrock Rovers are what four points clear with a game in hand this early in the in the season. And you look back at Shamrock Rovers hadn't lost a game all last year, so them, that four points is 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 a massive uh, uh, is a massive uh, you know gap. So at this even at this early stage, but confidence I think is 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 a bit low in Dundalk. They're not the same Dundalk. They're becoming predictable, um, which is uh, teams now aren't don't really fear them as much. 
Yeah, and uh, looking forward then to the games over the weekend. Of course, Bowes and Longford played out an entertaining two-all draw. Bowes will have to count this as two points lost. Longford coming back from 2-0 down. Um, a team of Bowes class you would expect to be closing out a game against newly promoted Longford. Just didn't happen for them. Just didn't happen. No, I watched the game and, and Bowes, I thought when Bowes went 2-0 up, I said oh, I felt for Longford, but... They never say die attitude at Longford and 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 what Dara has has installed in in the in the team, albeit there wasn't the weren't quality, but they never gave up. They I was you know I was impressed with them uh, that that sense, and they always say if you work hard you get your rewards and you did and was sloppy defending for 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 both goals really from by both perspective and Kate Long would be really really disappointed because these are the games if they really want to be challenging uh, at the top they've got to be winning these games even at this early stage. How good is it for Connor Davis though? Because he's had a tough, maybe 12, 15 months with injury. He didn't play at all last season. Didn't work out from down in Cork. He joined Longford. I don't know how much was expected of him, but to come in like that, uh, score a goal within a couple of minutes of coming onto the pitch late on and then grab the equaliser. Um, he's got to be one happy bunny this week. Almost definitely. He's been out so long and it's so difficult when you're out injured and you're looking at the other players on the pitch. Um, but he's come back and I'm delighted from getting the two goals. And that second goal um, just shows the determination of that Longford team. He just gambled at the back stake. It was it was a defender's ball to clear, you know, and he gambled and he got his uh, he got the goal and the second goal. And I'm delighted for him and especially being out so long with that injury. Yeah, and the final game of the weekend, we might come back and just talk about Harps and Longford just in terms of where they'll finish later on. But that final game of the weekend, Pats and Drogheda, um, a bit of a seesaw battle. Rona Coughlin opened the score and Dinny Corcoran, a bit of an opportunist from a mistake by the goalkeeper we talked about last week, who we both fancy in terms of, of being a real talent. Uh, Jaros, the, the Czech goalkeeper from Liverpool, uh, Drogheda did equalise. And then the last minute from Billy King. Um, we're going to talk to Stephen O'Donnell about it later on. But from a manager's point of view, like you've got to be delighted when your team gets sucker punched and then you come out and steal all three points at the end of the game. Yeah, he'd be delighted. He, his first home game of the season to get off the mark. He's he's striker to get a goal, uh, get off the mark. That's crucial. There's no pressure going on him now for yeah, you know, you haven't scored in you know in a couple of weeks. But um, the the he, he Ronan's goal was was you know sloppy enough. But they don't it doesn't care how they go in. They go in. But it was a comedy of errors for the Pats. Uh, I think John Mountney gave it away and then it went, they went down got the cross in and then this mistake by the keeper but as you said uh, Stephen would be absolutely delighted 90th minute winner uh, backstake uh, get the season off up and running home win and uh, bring the confidence that they've been an un- unbeaten start yeah, I think he'd have taken uh, four points from the opening two games when the fixtures came out. So uh, we'll chat to him about that later on. In terms of the shakeup of the league, let's be honest, nobody really expects Oli to, to be in the Champions League next season. Um, people, he'll be, and he'll be the first person to say it, he'll be happy just to stay above the promotion or relegation playoff. How important will these six points, and, and in Longford's case as well, who are also tipped to struggle overall, those four points in terms of giving them that motivation, that head start, that momentum to maybe just stay above that battle a little bit and just psychologically to be those place or two higher in the table. How much of a difference does that make to someone who's... You've had a couple of those challenges yourself in the year, over the year. Uh, you look at it, it is, it, it's, it's about confidence at the start of the year and a bit of momentum. And Finn Harps have it at the minute. They're going to hit a, a, a bad patch. All teams do. They all hit a bad patch. It's how they come back out of it. But as you said there, that they, them, them points that they've now on the board, could be crucial come the end of the season. But we're in a league that's so tight. Uh, we've seen it last year. One win, you know, takes you into into European spot. And one defeat brings you back into the relegation spot. So it's going to be so tight. And I think Finn Harps and the likes of Longford and Drogheda, they know every single game that they play, they have to try and get something from it. And it is going to be a really close league this year, as in, there's no whipping boys. There's no team. You know, I I, I spoke about Waterford uh, being. Thing, I was I was a bit impressed with them the last day against uh, Sligo Rovers. I just feel they're a little bit naive. So, but the Longford have that spirit. They have that desire. Don't really have the quality uh, as of yet. But that will probably come with games. And you know, Finn Harps, they have Ollie. You know, 
Ollie's a magician when it comes to these kind of mind games and stuff. And he said after the game, he's uh, six points won't keep you in the division. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, Adam Foley as well looks to be a, a find, having not really made much of an impact at the end of last year when he did join the club. But I think uh, he's on fire, and if he can keep that going through the next couple of weeks, I think they they could be in a really really healthy position. Um, uh, maybe the end of the first round of games. Uh, let's turn our attention for a minute to the first division. Uh, some really good games took place over the weekend. Um, we'll come to Treaty United's introduction to the league in just a few moments. We'll look maybe at Friday night's games first. Um, we're going to be talking to to Michael O'Connor later on the show. So maybe we'll start with the Shells Galway game. Both teams tipped to be um, probably the favourites to win the league. A lot of investment gone in. We talked last week on the show about potentially this being a little bit of a, a chess game, not wanting to show their full hand. And it kind of felt like that. Shells lost a player early on, uh, finished up nil-nil draw. Lost a player for a, a red card, has to be said. Glenn McCauley was sent off. Nil-nil, um, the final score. Was that both managers kind of happy enough with that, do you think? No, I'd say John, John Coffey would be very disappointed at home. Um I think he was he was sent off in the first half early enough, and you know you're 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 thinking you're at home eleven v ten. You need to you know get three points on the board. But um, Michael O'Connor had a uh, strike in the second half, hit the crossbar, so they could have easily got beaten. So you know a draw, possibly maybe a fair result. Um, but uh, Ian Morris would definitely be happy with the draw, but John Coffey would be, would be the, the the most upset. Yeah, I would think so. Uh, big Munster Derby down in uh, Cork. Cork City versus Cove Ramblers. Uh, 2-1 to Cork um, in terms of, of the local bragging rights at least. You probably would have expected that going into that game. You would have because if you look back at Cork for the last couple of years, we've we've known Cork as league champions and FBI Cups and obviously last year was, it was a disastrous year for them, unfortunately. And they've had to regroup, but uh, they've got off to a, you know, a great start. It's what you want, Colin Healy at home. Um, his first game uh, against Cove, you know. So uh, Cork, Cork are going to be. I I don't think they'd be challenging this year. I think they they need another year or two to regroup, but they'll definitely become back good and strong. And Cove are always a, a, a dogged team to play against, and they will take points off off uh, off teams. And we, we spoke there about the Premier Premier League being tight. I think the first division is going to be great watch this year. Yeah, of course, we had, uh, speaking of people we've had on the show, of course, we had uh, last week on the show, Tom Murphy, the goalkeeper from Wexford FC, dis- disappointed to have lost to Cabin Teeley first day out, 2-1 uh, win for the, the Black Rock base side down at Ferry Carrick on Friday night. Yeah, Cabin Teeley, uh, again, they were there all the, last year with the with the points deduction or or whatever goal he sneaked in. And um, it was, I don't know, whatever the controversy was there. But Cabin Teeley, you know... Uh, will be in the mix-up as well. And Wexford, you know, kind of, you don't know what to get with them each year. Um, you know, some years they're, they, again, it's down to confidence, isn't it, at the start. They, they will be disappointed to start the season. And thing, But like what I said on, on the show before, five or six games in, that's when the league starts to settle. And you kind of, you know, one half the league will have confidence, the others won't. So it, it's, it, it'll take five or six games, I think, for, for everything settles down. Yeah, the final game on Friday night, uh, UCD and Athlone Town, a, an entertaining game in Belfield. Uh, Athlone, Adam Wickstead, a former Sligo Rovers player, we're going to be talking to another former Sligo Rovers player playing that game, Jack Kinney, later in the show. But Adam Wickstead popped up uh, to get a, an, an equaliser in the last minute for Athlone Town. That's got to be heartbreaking for Andy Myler's side. Yeah, d- definitely. You know, you're you're so close. You're so close to the end, and but at loan, we 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 you know we spoke to Adrian Carberry on the on the first show, and he set out his plans, and they're not going to be uh, an easy team either this year, like you know, and uh, that will give them it's 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 the fine margins of football, you know, you're you're two minutes off a win, you're two minutes off a defeat, and all of a sudden you're the team that makes the late goal is delighted with a draw, and the team that's just got you know after conceding are, are devastated, so. At loan to be full of confidence after that, and UCD are a good side, and uh, they have some very good young up and coming players again, and uh, they've been no uh, pushovers in the league either. Absolutely, and the final game of the weekend in the league was, of course, the arrival of Treaty United. We saved the best for last in terms of the the big news celebrations of the week. Treaty made the trip to the Carlisle grounds. It was a fairly stale affair. They also lost a player, a second yellow card for Sean McSweeney, and he found himself taking an early bath. But it was Bray 
who were probably the more frustrated on the day, just couldn't quite break down a fairly resolute three the United defence, uh, scoreless in the Carlisle grounds in what looked like horrendous conditions. Yeah, great result uh, for Treaty. First game in the league. Um, you know, people might look at them as the soft touch this year, but they've just gone Bray. Bray are a very, very good side and they've gone and, and, and got a draw and it's a it's a great to get their up and running uh, and the season off uh, to a, albeit a point, a point, but um, a way to Bray, it's, it's never easy going there and uh, delighted for them. Yeah, Ty Ryan made a phenomenal point blank save very, very early, early in the game, maybe in the first 15 minutes and he probably had no right to get to it, pulled it off and in doing, probably gave Treaty a platform to kind of build from and defend. But I think had that gone in, I think Bray might have opened the opened the floodgates a little bit because Bray were the dominant team, make no mistake about it. But um, Treaty, I'm delighted for them that they're up and running. It's great to have football back in Limerick. Their first home game, they're already sending out the media accreditation information and uh, you can feel a real buzz about the return of League of Ireland football after only one year, albeit... But still, it's, they're delighted to be back up and running. And I think it's fantastic for the region and the city and, and the players and Tommy and the people behind the scenes who've made that happen. Um, we might jump straight into some of the interviews we've got lined up for this week. We've caught up with a few people earlier in the day. Uh, let's start with the St. Prince Athletic Manager, Stephen O'Donnell. Now, one person who'll be delighted with the way the results went, and especially Billy King's last-minute winner over the weekend to give his side all three points against Strata United is St. Pat's manager, Stephen O'Donnell, and he joins us now. Stephen, you're very welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me, lads. Looking no, it's been great. And I know you're an, an old teammate at Kino's, so we're going to have to maybe get some dirt on him as well at some stage during the chat. But uh, how has your, your start to the season gone? You must be happy enough with the way things have gone, a, a draw away in Tala and then a, a last-minute winner last week against Drada. Yeah, I suppose the tale of two kind of two two weeks and two last-minute goals, one went against us uh, in Tala, you know, an equaliser, late equaliser. After taking the lead so so late on, it was it was a tough one to take. You'd be you'd be thinking you'd hang on or and win the game, and then the second week, you know, it just shows you football swings and roundabouts. We get a last minute winner, so delighted. And um, obviously, we know there's loads we can improve on, but ultimately, four points from the first two games is is a re- reasonable start and something to, something to build on. Stephen, I looking at la- last year, obviously it must have been frustrating for you, you know, coming in and. You seemed like a team that was a team didn't really fear you. You were uh, giving away sloppy goals and stuff. This year, what I've noticed watching the first two games is you've really got a solid back four, and you, you've really kind of shored up that side. Do you think? I know. I suppose every manager thinks the final third now is kind of is that a work in motion where you're kind of started with the bases at the back and work your way up. Yeah, definitely. Look, last year I suppose our defensive record last year was um was the third best in the league. We we had I think it was eight clean sheets um out of eighteen games. But as you said, like some of the goals we gave away were calamitous. Really, you know, we 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 gifted leads to teams and then found it hard, obviously, to get back in the game. You know, in this league, the first goal is huge, and and we gave up the first goal too easy too many times last last year, but. You know, we did keep quite a lot of clean sheets. It's the one we didn't keep clean sheets in. It's sort of the goals we gave up were, were very, very cheap. The the other problem, I suppose, last year was at the other end, you know, we were I think we were the third lowest scorers in the league out of obviously 10 teams. So something we have, we have to rectify. And, um, you know, it, it's the hardest part of the game, as you know, Kino scoring goals. You know, that's why yeah. strikers are paid the most money and creative players are, are, are paid the most money because it's the hardest part. So... You know, we have a good foundation, plus we have a bit of continuity this year. We do have new players, but the spine of our team or the spine of our squad was here last year, whereas, uh, you know, last off-season, it was pretty much a whole new team. And then, obviously, with the COVID as well, we didn't get time to work with each other properly. It was an 18-game season. I was happy with the way we finished the season last year from a football point of view. Probably didn't get the points that I felt we deserved in the games. But uh, it was more solid sort of foundation this year in regards uh, personnel. And then obviously we've added a bit to that as well. So, you know, I, I like the group specifically. They they want to learn and they want to get better and they're ambitious individually and as a collective this year. So 
that's something I do enjoy working with and I'm looking forward to working with. But no doubt, like we do, we do have lots to improve on. But as I said, four points from the first two games is a, is a reasonable start. Yeah, in terms of the, suppose, the personnel that you've brought in, obviously on the score sheet on Saturday um, was Ronan Coughlin. Um, he opened the scoring for you. He's a big name coming in from Sligo. He was probably Sligo's talisman up front last year, but only really scored two goals from play, a lot of them from the penalty spot. You must be delighted to see him get off the up and running in the second game, particularly from play. Yeah, definitely. Look, Ronan, he played three preseason games. I think he scored two in preseason and three games. And then he's got, as you said, he scored now in the second game of the, of the season. Look, I've always liked Ronan. Um, at Cork, probably didn't play as much as he would have liked. And then, you know, I felt uh, <clears throat> before he went to Sligo, I saw him in the uh, Munster Senior Cup against Cove for Cork. And he was the best player on the pitch. And then a few days later, he signed for Sligo. And then with his couple of seasons with Sligo, I thought he's been excellent. As you said, you know, two goals from play last year, but I thought, you know, a lot of his play probably went went unheralded in the sense he, he he was a real focal point for Sligo and he brought so many people into into the game. And when it came up to him, his touch was secure and he'd done a lot of running down the sides and that and probably a lot of his best work outside the box. So um it's something that we'd hope service wise and that we can sort of curb his a lot of running outside his box and that and make him, you know, play a little bit more within the width of the 18 yard box. But as a footballer and bringing people into play, I don't think there's many better in the sense of, you know, being a focal point for a team and just his quality in that. And, um, you know, as as you said, it's great for a front man, especially the type of goal it was. It was a cross and it's basically, you know, you had a scruffy goal. Uh, I don't know what part of his anatomy it hit, but it went in from two or three yards out. So there are goals I do like seeing strikers score because it means they're, getting in there in the danger area on the end of things. So, you know, it's great for him. But as a footballer, I have absolutely no issues. You know, I thought first two seasons with Sligo, he was their standout player consistently. And then, um, you know, as you said, if we can just add that with Ronan, you know, uh, goal scoring from general play, which I think he will. And I think he, he's hungry to do the rest of his game is is um, excellent. Yeah, obviously, Ronan, I've seen a good bit of him last year. and. I really, really like him as a player. I think his work rate uh, is is exceptional, and I think probably Sligo last year probably the service to him wasn't with Romeo going and Stephen Romeo had a great partnership the year before, uh, and I really I was disappointed to see him go. But also I like the way the squad you put together, Stephen. Is you you have a nice blend there now. You've you've the league winners obviously Mountney, uh, Benson, uh, Paddy Barrett, and, and I'm really impressed with with the with the keeper. Um, did you use your contacts in England uh, from your time at Arsenal to, to lure him here? Or how, how did no, it wasn't even. It's just, you, so I suppose you have to do a lot of hours, I suppose, looking at uh, under 23 games, that type of stuff. And then you might um, drop. It was sort of a coincidence. Obviously, you're on the lookout for a goalkeeper and then, um, you know, Veet's name cropped up. And then you go and do your homework and watch Liverpool under 23 games and watch sort of check a trade games and then. Then you see if it's kind of a realistic runner and then obviously you do a bit more homework and then you know that's how it kind of materialized and um delighted with feet um you know he's 19 year old keeper but he doesn't play like a 19 year old if, if you're watching him and seeing him in training that you're saying that's a 28 29 year old uh, experienced goalkeeper so you know he's a big future ahead of him we're delighted to have him and he's a great he's a great kid and he's really settled in well um, I think there is a good blend, uh, blend as you said we do have experience we have boys that were at the club like Ian Byrne and Lee Desmond Chris Forrester was here he's came back um, you know so they know the DNA of the club uh, Jamie Lennon who's come up through the youths then we have a lot of younger players that have come up through the sec- successful sort of St. Pat's underage structure that want to kick on with a lot of talent then we have boys that we sort of brought in um, you know like the boys we've mentioned a few lads that were at Dundalk and then there's other boys that have come in from cross channel and that and good players from uh, domestically from around the league. So I am happy. There's a good blend. Felt a good vibe in pre-season and that with the players, you know, you don't know when you get new faces, how they want to mix. But I felt that they've mixed well so far in pre-season and the start of the season. As I said, that late goal can only galvanise teams and squads. So I am happy. But ultimately, you have to do your talking on the pitch and, and results will dictate dictate where we're at not me talking to you guys saying I'm happy with the blend of the squad you know 
in terms of, I suppose, some of the players that have left the club over the last four or five months, um, Georgie Kelly and Jordan Gibson, both on the score sheet for other teams in the league this season. Do you look at that with maybe a little bit of an envious eye and kind of wonder maybe why things didn't work out with those two individuals at the club no, last year? No, I thought the both lads in, in different individual games played played really well for us, you know. Ultimately, you have dis- you like to have decisions to make and that's the nature of the league. It's it's a tight league. If if players have um, have ability, other clubs are going to be after them. So there's always a risk, you know, especially with year to year contracts. Alan will know that's the most of the league basically of year to year contracts. So then, it's kind of open season come the end of every season. So that's the risk you're going to lose players. I didn't expect to lose the two boys and them not to score another goal, you know, in their career that they're going to score goals to have ability. So that's just part of the course, you know. We've got players from other teams too that'll be. Other clubs would be disappointed to lose. So that's just that's just the League of Ireland. That's that's the league we're in. So um no, I wish the lads obviously when they don't play against us, but I wish them all the best in their careers, uh, you know, because they're both good lads and I'd like to see them do well. And Stephen, how did you obviously it all came about so quick? Um the Pat's job. How did you find that transition from you know being a player and obviously a, I, I lived with you for what six months or whatever. I, I see how much you 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 know you love the game and and you analyze the game. Um, how did you find that transition from a player going straight into the management side? Yeah, as you said, Alan, like it kind of went pretty much straight from playing into management, not really transition to coaching. Done a bit around six or seven months with. Um, with Dundalk as doing the analysis and you know doing the opposition analysis and that but wasn't really on the pitch every day um, and the coaching department so usually you see players they retire and then they go into a bit of coaching then they take on the management job or the head coach job um, so you know I sort of went straight into it head first um, and you know it is different like we'd all have opinions as players and and um, you know, it's kind of black and white when you're a player. Why is he doing that? Why is he doing this? But there's there's a lot more to it than that. You have a, you have sort of, you know, along with Alan Matthews and that and the coaching staff, we have we have 20, 22 players and to keep happy. And, you know, ultimately we've all been there. The manager is a good guy when and the head coach, you know, when me and Alan picked them and, and um, you know, not liked when they're not picked, you know what I mean, when they're not in the team. So it's a very fine balance and act of keeping everyone happy. It is different. It's not as black and white as I would have thought as a player without a shadow of a doubt, but you got to manage it as best you can. I think the best way like, is just honesty with players. You know, um, I don't think players like being bullshitted to, or waffled. To, they're, they're not silly. They can see when someone's kind of spinning a lie or, or not being truthful with them. So you have to be as honest as much as you can with them. And I think they'll respect that and ultimately... It's nothing personal, personal, it's just football decisions, you know. Yeah, you mentioned Alan Matthews, and of course there's been a lot of talk about the situation in Dundalk, about who might be in charge or whatever. Can you tell us a little bit, I suppose, maybe about the, the breakdown of, of the, the responsibilities between yourself and Alan and other members of the team? Who kind of is in charge of what? Yeah, well, ultimately, like, I think all good sort of coaching staff, everyone's kind of in it together, everyone has an opinion, you know, and then we we sort of brainstorm and then and then you come up with your with your starting eleven, your tactics, that type of stuff. So, you know, Alan has massive experience. He's um he's been a lot around the league as we know, been at some big clubs, won a won a lot of trophies. And yeah, no, he's a huge he's a huge help and the like Sean O'Connor and Patrick Craig and and PJ the goalkeeping coach on the football side of it, you know, they're they're all massive parts. Everyone has an input and then we sort of um, that's how we sort of formulate our plans, formulate our team. It's it's a it's a team thing. All all the other sort of good clubs I've been to and I've done a bit of asking about, it's been the same kind of backroom staff have opinions and then, you know, we formulate a a plan together of how we're gonna sort of the key is I suppose everyone's been on the same wavelength. So from a football point of view, so you're not having huge clashes in regards ideas, etc. Um, you know, we're pretty much all on the same page, and then it's just a case of a tweak here and there with a system or or a team selection. So you know, it's 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 going really well. It's it's a real good team environment, not just the the, the football players, the playing side of it, the staff side of it as well. We all muck in together, and there's a real sense of feeling the satisfaction. Like Saturday, for instance, as a 
as a team environment too with the staff getting a late, late goal it's a great sense of satisfaction and in terms of the season ahead Stephen you're obviously uh, you're, you, you, you obviously have your own personal targets as in as a team but I'm surely you, you'll be looking to, to push to Europe this year um, with, with say with that kind of squad you have and with the way the league is you know you'd be fancied as a top three top four side yeah like the big thing as I said to our lads in pre-season was you know we like I think it's acceptable that sixth isn't accepted, you know, a Pats, you know, be accepted this season. Uh, we want to improve on last year. You know, I think we're in a good position to do that. But as I said, ultimately, we have to show that on the pitch. Um, not gonna, you, seasons like matches, I suppose, you've played enough matches, Keno, to take on a life of their own once the first whistle's gone. And seasons do the same. You don't know who's going to ride a crest of a wave early doors. Um, you don't know who's going to struggle early doors, and then momentum's massive for a season as well, you know. So you're never going to predict. Well, um, I spe- I think especially the way the league is this season, you're never going to earmark. Now this season, I don't think good chance of three points there. We'll be lucky to get a point there. I think you can see now. I don't think that is the consistency. I don't think that's a, a first couple of week thing. I think that's going to be the season throughout. It's going to be. It's going to be open. I think there are going to be a lot of different results. So I'm not going to pigeonhole us into a position. We just want to improve on the pitch every day and improve on last season, obviously, and see where that takes us. But as I said, I do think the league is open. I think you've seen that in the first two two rounds of games. There is an open field to the league. And, you know, I do think there are a lot of teams that can finish in different positions. It's whoever gets consistency in their game and, and gets that little bit of momentum. Are you surprised by the start that some clubs have made to the league? The likes of, like, let's be honest, no pundit had Finn Harps and Longford Town top of the league after two rounds of games. Like, is that a surprise to you? Like, how strong maybe Drogheda were the other day? No, it's not. To be honest, I I thought in pre season I probably would have said it a few quotes. I thought the league is open this year. I do think it is open this year. Obviously, Shannon Rovers are, were unbeaten last year and the reigning champions. And, you know, when you're reigning champions and you win the league so easy last season, uh, you're going to be the team to beat. But I do think there is an open field to it. Um, like, ultimately, Finn Harps having six points out of two games and not gobsmacked, you know, you wouldn't say, I knew they were going to have six points after two games either, but it's um, there is an open field to it. And I do think it is going to be an open league more so than other years, without, without a doubt. I do think it has that feel to it. And, there are different teams that have done uh, recruited and it remains to be seen how they've recruited. But I think, you know, whoever gets that momentum and, and that it, momentum can take you a long way, you know, it can take you a long way. It can give lads a lot of belief. And, you know, once players are playing with belief, um, that's half the battle. So I do feel there is an open, it, there's an open field to the season. I think it will be open. And as I said, I think you will get, Results that in the norm you might be saying, whoa, that's a surprising result, or I didn't see that coming. I do think there will be a lot of them this year. I, I totally agree, Stephen. Yeah, that the the league this year, there's no whipping boys. You know, even looking at last year's league, uh, someone that was in the playoffs, a win or t- uh, they're only four points off, nearly fourth place. So I think it's even going to be tighter this year. And you you touched on Shamrock Rovers. I think losing the two boys in the middle of the park has now brought them back into the closer to, to the other teams below them rather than kicking on because the amount of goals the two lads scored last year to take that out of the team I think it's going to be that's what's going to make the league really competitive and really looking forward to it this year because it's going to be topsy-turvy I think all, all throughout the year Yeah I do too I think it'll be exciting I do yeah mm. Talking about exciting you, uh, Kino mentioned you spent six months living with him up in Dundalk uh, any, any dirt any stories Who is he? does he do the dishes after himself or what's the other crack No Kino was a good housemate um, it was kind of it was a, le- a bit of a left fielder wasn't it Kino um, yeah but he came in done really well in the game remember he played a, remember he played the pivotal game against Cork at Oriel done brilliant that night he, um, standing ovation off the off the main stand and that um, I was getting but, abused a couple of months earlier off them. It's mad. Yeah, well, that's that's football, isn't it? That's always yeah. the way. But yeah. you know, gave us great experience, and then obviously he was involved in the in the in the European run and that. So, um, no, done really well. We live with each other. Yeah, does who else was living in the house at that stage? Mounts, uh, John Mountney, Benson, and Barry. 
Well, there are three lads that are at the club yeah. now. Now, as so, I said, so, I did say you know. I suppose, <laughs> suppose Keno was waiting for the phone call, maybe to sign him as well. <laughs> You're all right, Stevie. There's no danger. <laughs> I didn't sign the three boys because they were housemates, because they're um, they're good players. But oh, no, yeah. it was good times. And probably only looking back, you probably took it for well, not took it for granted, but you're kind of in the bubble. You're just looking, working day on day, and focusing on the next game. But then you're looking back and saying, you know, it was a good, it was a good adventure. Obviously, playing group stages and being busy going playing end the season sort of league showdowns and then playing cup finals. We played in Russia on the Thursday and then. We played in the cup final on the Sunday afternoon, so you know it was hectic. It was a lot of games punched into the end of the season. Yeah, well, listen, Stephen, you hopefully you have plenty of games this year as well towards the end of the season as you prepare for a challenge of the title and the cup and the whole lot to come later in the year. Thanks very much for joining us. It's been great. Um, Kino is going to be waiting for that phone call now for the next couple of weeks, just in case he's he's available. He's unattached, so you can still probably sign him. Stephen, the legs are gone. Legs we'll have gone. to give him a good pre-season. <laughs> Best of luck for the season ahead. Right. Thanks a Best million, lads. Now, one player who'll be well known to a lot of League of Ireland clubs because he's had as many clubs as Tiger Woods over the years is Michael O'Connor of Shelburne. Michael, you're very welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Thank you. I'm poking a little bit of fun there, but um, you have had a couple of clubs in the last few seasons. You started last year with Waterford. You moved to not or to Ross County in in Scotland, and now you're back with Shells. How has the preseason gone in the first game of the season down in Terryland last weekend? Or it's not Terryland anymore. In DC Park last weekend. Um, yeah, look, it's it's good to be home. Uh, it didn't work in Scotland, you know, but preseason's been going uh, very well. It's been probably the longest one. I think we've all had um over the years but last week uh went well i thought you know we got a man sent off early doors um and then it's obviously always going to be a struggle with 10 men but um i thought even with 10 men we didn't look like losing the game uh we were very well organized um and then we got the point in the end that we wanted um Mika. I just that Ross County move. How did it? How did it come about? And and uh, you know, you, you were you're with Waterford. You went from was it Waterford to Linfield and Linfield back, or how yeah, did that move so, come about? Me. It was sort of obviously when I when I signed for Linfield, um, then a move came about of a swap deal with Bastian Harry to go to the to Linfield the opposite way, um, and Rennie was the manager of Waterford at the time. And it was something that, you know, I looked at and said, like, you know, I'm going to play every week. I'm young. I need games. I know. And I was the main man up front. So I wasn't going to turn it down. Uh, Yeah. Captain last year. Yeah. I think, you know, everyone probably looked at it and said, you know, what are they doing? Making this fella captain, you know. But it was for obvious reasons where, like, off the pitch, you know, I knew I couldn't, you know, be in trouble or anything. And I had a responsibility, should I say. You know, to yeah. to do things properly, and that's what I was uh, going to lead me on to. You, 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 you come out publicly, and uh, you, you, which I thought was very, very brave of you to come out and and uh, talk about your problems off the pitch. So, it kind of shows an example to the younger lads coming through that the likes of you, who is now captain of the, who was captain of the Waterford team at the time. Uh, to come out. Do you want to touch on that a little bit? Yeah, it was just, you know, it wasn't even for football reasons, for family reasons as well, because, you know, I let my family down, I let, you know, good people around me down and, you know, to be honest, you know, I probably, sh- I should be still at Dundalk, you know, if I'm honest, if I had done things properly. But look, I live and I learn and I won't make that mistake again, but uh, the best thing I could do was, you know, put it out there and make people aware, you know, I'm not afraid to say it, like, you know, it nearly destroyed me. Um, but look, we're on the, the right path now, and that's the that's the main thing. Yeah, how nice is it to be back just playing football again? I suppose the, the fixture computer hasn't been particularly kind to you at the start of the season. You've played Galway last week. You're playing Bray Wanderers at home this weekend. Uh, it's just tough game after tough game after tough game. The first division is fairly competitive this year. Yeah, it looks, it looks tasty. Like, you know, um, even Bray and Bray are going to be really good and I'm, I'm sure they'll be at it now on friday you know um but obviously it's one that we're going to be ready for and uh, we look to take all three points but uh even you know three to united coming into the league people are probably looking at it saying you know you know yourself you're probably looking at it from a player's point of view and you're saying oh here it is but you know 
every game is going to be tough. Mm-hmm. And uh, we obviously the first division. There's yourselves. You're down as favourites. Uh, you know the the one about Galway, but you touched on it there. Like no, I think it's going to be so competitive that league. I, the the you know in years it hasn't been yeah. that competitive. But how are you going to deal with the favourites tag? But you have signed some quality players. Actually, to be honest with you, I think the players that you signed is like a premier uh, premier division team. To be honest, so how yeah, are you going to just... deal with that? I was just going to say that, you know, we probably are a Premier Division outfit, um, you know, with the players we've stuck in and stuff, Clarkie, Kev O'Connor, Bally, um, you know, but I don't really think we're thinking about, you know, being league favourites. We're just taking every game as it comes and we want to win every game like like anyone does. But, um, you know, we should be going out every week and dominating games and creating chances. Um, and I, I, I don't think, like, we haven't even spoken about winning the league, you know. Uh, we're just taking it week by week and you know, hopefully we get three points every week. Yeah, in terms of that, I suppose, recruitment drive over the, the winter, I think every time we saw an announcement from Shells, it was like, oh, he's going to play in the first division next year. It just was one after the other, after the other established Premier Division players. Was it a case, I suppose, from the outside looking in, was it a case of of a lot of that business was done or kind of deals were kind of done privately before the end of the season and the relegation kind of came out of left field? just with a freak set of results towards the end of the season that kind of knocked the Premier Division squad into the First Division? Well, I, um, it's it's a funny one. Like, I, I looked at it and when, when I got a phone call off Rennie, um, you know, Rennie was at Waterford and that's probably where I've been happiest playing football. And I just said, you know, and to be honest, not many clubs were in looking for me, you know, though my phone wasn't hopping. Um, and when Rennie rang me, I was like, you know, I could go down here and, you know, I could be the top goal scorer in the, in the league this year. Well, that's the that's my target anyway, and my goal. Um, but the players we signed, I don't think many people have been have been chasing. Uh, you know, and they're like wounded animals and just want to go out and prove themselves this year. You know. Do you think you being a, such a young young? Uh, what age were you when you made the Champions League debut that time? Uh, seventeen. And do you think that has kind of, you know, had an effect on you uh, going forward? But has it also made you as a player to, to to when you look back and you go, I was there, I want to get back to there again. So you yeah, obviously yeah. have your own personal targets for the year, um, as every player normally does. But would that be like a driving uh, driving force for you going forward? Yeah, definitely. Like, you know, from from my own point of view, I don't think I should be playing at this at this level, but I'm here for a reason. Um and then touching on that, you know, going back to, you know, when I came on and then you know, you get your bonuses and stuff, and I was too comfortable in Dundalk, you know, and I thought I was, I thought I was bigger than what I was. I'm in nightclubs, thank him, great fella, you know, and as I think any other 17-year-old will do, you're, you're spending money and you don't realise what you're doing, uh, you know, and I made a lot of mistakes, you know, that if I could look, go back now and change it, I would, um, but as I said, you live and you learn, um, but I just have to move on and keep going forward, uh, hopefully do well this season, and then, See where it takes me, but I need to, you know, settle, settle at one club and uh, push on uh, because you can't, you know, keep keep going around clubs like, you know. Yeah, I probably wasn't fair to you in the introduction in terms of the, the golf joke, but at the same time, uh, there's a really good vibe coming out of Shells at the moment, both on and off the pitch in terms of where they're looking to be this season. Uh, is it important for you to kind of really get involved in that and be a contributor to what success may come for them this season? Yeah, well, I hope so, you know, uh, I want to play a big part in, you know, hopefully uh, going on to successful things this year. Um, there's a great buzz around the camp, you know, with Rennie and Ian and uh, Willie's in there, that was at Finn House, Willie O'Connor, Dave McAllister, that was ex-Rovers midfielder, he's involved with us as well. Um, you know, there's some really, really top coaches there. Um, and then off the field, like, the lads are great lads, like, you know, there's not, there's not one bad player you could point the finger at you know um and then me off the field i just want to have the crack and you know have good vibes around the, the whole the camp and stuff and every time we go into training you're not you're not dreading going to train and you're like oh i'm actually really looking forward to this like you know whereas when i first signed you could hear bad things about last year you know like too much negativity and you know i don't, I don't know too much about it so i can't really speak enough about it like you know when you came in, obviously you you you've not been with the squad when they're relegated. Has the management team like 
obviously with the new signings and stuff, they've they've lifted the because it is difficult when you get relegated. Everyone is looking at at you as a, as a team, and you're going to say, you know, it, it, you don't want it on your CV. How or how did you see them with the lift the spirits or? You know, is it just no no talk about last year at all and just look look forward? Uh, yeah, like you know, I think they got rid of a few players who would have been involved in the sort of negativity last year, you know, and brought in a lot of new boys. Um, and to be, to be fair, like a few of us know each other, uh, like myself, Julie, Lonnie, Kev, um, I'm trying to think who else we signed, uh, would have been at Waterford together, Maxi, uh, you know, and we had a really good spirit, uh, even Rennie coming in, uh, you know, we had a really good spirit down at Waterford. and. I'm just trying to to change things like negativity is going to get you nowhere like you know so i think you've got to think positive um because and, we, and then when we look at the team you got to say like right okay let's have a look around you here look at the players beside you we can achieve anything we want you know if if we put our heads on it and um, so that's that's the way we're looking at it there has been no talk of it uh last year you know briefly between players you know yourself you know you have the odd chat about it but there has been not, nothing really about it last year's uh, relegation well, I suppose that's uh, something you're hoping to put right this year as a squad and get yourselves yeah. back to the division at the first opportunity. Michael, we've run out of time. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure to have you. Uh, best luck for the season ahead. And we'll uh, probably talk to you on the show at some point in the season, maybe with a, a league trophy in your hand. Perfect. Thanks very much. Cheers, Kino. Best of luck, Michael. Now, one student who's not so worried about exams at the moment is former Sligo Rovers player, someone we both know fairly well, Alan, uh, Jack Keeney, and he joins us now. He's captain of UCD in the first division of the SSB Electricity League. Jack, you're very welcome. Thanks for joining us. No bother, boys. Thanks for having me. <laughs> That's a, a strange Dublin 4 accent you have there. Obviously, the <laughs> WL leads coming through. Uh, talk to us about the season so far. Disappointed after the weekend to we not have taken all three points against uh, Athlone? Yeah, massively disappointing. Um, look, it was the first game, and I think every team was probably looking at them was a bit scrappy. So we just wanted to come out there with um, with a good performance and three points. And on the day, we were probably disappointing, especially in the first half, how we played. Um, and then we went to goal up and then probably conceded a sloppy goal. But I thought the second half was much better and just disappointing, you know, conceding very last minute. And, um, but look, we'll, we'll take a point and move on. And we're just glad to be back playing, I think, like everyone else is. Jack, I'm, I'm, um, I'm always, I was always intrigued with UCD and now having you on here. How does it work, or how do you balance your the books with UCD? Is it like do you go all day in in, in college, and and or is it everyday football, or what is your your kind of routine, or how how does it work? How do you balance both? Yeah, I, I suppose it's a good question, Alan. And if you'd asked me probably this time last year before COVID, it was probably a lot more intense because before COVID, all our um, all our lessons was in campus. So, you know, we were kind of juggling, maybe going to the gym and uh, before college started, eight o'clock in the morning, and then maybe going to lectures and then going home to try and eat and then get ready for training. So I think our training, to maybe touch on that first, it hasn't really changed to what we did at Sligo. Um, from at Sligo, we were kind of in Monday and Tuesday, maybe off Wednesday and train Thursday, Friday, game Saturday. But up here, our home games are on a Friday night. So... We train Monday and Wednesday and maybe a Thursday morning um, if we can get it in as well. Um, and then we're in the gym Tuesday and then just the recovery on Saturday. So I suppose the football aspect, it hasn't really changed much. But I think it's just on everyone to try and be like as much as organized as we can. You know, our, I'm pretty lucky this semester. I have only five modules instead of normally six. So I'm, prob- I'm not as busy. But other boys I know that are maybe on their last um, stint of college are pretty flat out and they might be doing assignments or might be doing placements. So, look, it is hard and you have to, you have to be, as probably the manager knows, you have to be very respectful in, in different ways, you know, with training aspect. And then, because there is boys, you know, working, say, to five o'clock and then coming straight to training. But I think that's what we all want to do and um, that's what we need to do to, to get to where we want to be. 
Yeah, I suppose it, you were in a slightly unique situation for UCD players because a lot of people come from school, go into UCD, and then progress on to have a professional career in the game, whether the likes of Robbie Benson, Conan Byrne. We, we know all the names who've passed through over the last 10 or 15 years in particular. But you had the professional taste a little bit before UCD, maybe for a year or two with Sligo. What's it been like adjusting back to that kind of half study, half football uh, both in terms of your time and also, I suppose, on the pocket, because you went from being a full-time employee of a football club to being a, a penniless student again. How does that work? Yeah, and I suppose it was a decision that I didn't take lightly. Um, I had always thought before I maybe signed with Sligo, the, my first pro contract, that I always needed to have something to back up. I have kind of a bit of perspective at home with my brother. He had... Uh, retire from Gaelic uh, with a hip injury at 26. So just small things like that. You know, I didn't I didn't take anything for granted. I kind of, I applied for the scholarship every year just to see if I'd get it. And I suppose after the second year, I did get it. I was lucky enough to get it. And I probably just needed to get out of um, home, like, you know, a bit of more independence for myself. And like, there's nothing to do with Sligo. Like I couldn't thank them highly enough. They were they were good enough to give me a, a debut and two or two and a half great years there. And I'd like to say, like, I've not nothing bad to say about the club and I hope the fans don't say that. Um, and look, moving up, it was it was a tough decision, you know, fending for yourself and kind of living away from home for the first time and not maybe coming home to mommy's cooking and mommy's, um, like, cleaning for you. So at the start, it was tough, but I'd like to say I was in, I moved up and Paul Doyle, an ex Sligo player as well, he kind of took me under his wing. We were in a house together and we all got to do the summer camp. So I think he kind of showed me the ropes straight away. And um, thankfully, I I, um, I, was, I moved in fairly early. And look, I know Liam Kerrigan came up the two weeks after. So I was probably like a father figure to him and the two of us are living together. So it's kind of great to have, you know, other footballers that are kind of maybe in the same aspect as you that want to maybe get a degree, but then want to go back into full-time football after then. I love how two weeks has uh, become a father figure, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can come down here and babysit my kids if you want. <laughs> two weeks. Oh, well, I'm, I'm well used to looking after the boys up here, so they might be a bit easier to, to, to look after. We obviously spoke in the, in the, with the clubs, uh, some clubs a couple of weeks back on this show about them looking after players for, for after, after football. And uh, how important is it for lads of your age to get, to get that education in at the start while playing football? And then, say, 24, 25, you can actually relax and then just enjoy football. Um, I know people, me included, uh, when I was playing, I just didn't think. I was like, oh, I'll do it next year. I'll do it next year. And before you know it, the years go by and you touched on it with your brother that got injured at 26. Your career is over in a shot with, without nothing. So what would your advice be to all the, say, the younger generations? And I, I'm sure you've left, you have a bit of a role model left here with lads and Sligo Rovers, uh, the underage, to see that you've come through the ranks and now you've gone on and you're gone to college. How would you, uh, you know, what advice would you have for them? Yeah, and I suppose it, it's it's nice to hear from your aspect to say that it is it was a good decision. You know, some people might say when you're 18 and you're playing full time at Sligo that you know it's the it's the pinnacle of where you wanted to be. But as you said, look, I'm not I'm not um I I knew you you kind of had to have something in the back pocket, and I suppose just talking and as you can say, like all the players you could name five or six on any Premier Division team that's gone to UCD. So, you know, there's obviously something good um, that's coming out of here. And I think the style of play, too, is very attractive. You know, the way that we like to play and get the ball down. And, you know, if, if managers are looking, they, team, they tend to, you know, have a good rollover from here. And maybe that's something that would, would work in our favour, you know, when we're coming to the end of our years. But to be honest, I can't speak highly enough of everything, the whole setup. Um from being looked after to, you know, to everything. Like, I suppose with COVID, it has been a bit hard. You know, we normally might have referee and we have during the week or um, the summer camps um, in the summer. But lucky, I think we're not the only club that um, is struggling with COVID. And lucky, just we're happy enough to be, to be back doing what we love, and that is playing football. How are you finding campus life uh, in a COVID world? It must be very strange because normally Belfield is absolutely bustling with activity. What's it like now? Is it a bit of a ghost town? 
Yeah, um, I suppose recently since Christmas, it's probably picked up maybe because maybe students are thinking that uh, they're sick of being home and they want to get back up. But I suppose for us, we're kind of in our own bubble. We we have to be fairly strict you know, on who we're meeting. Like, you know, we're kind of nearly in a bubble that we get up to a bit of college work, go to training and come home. And we're lucky enough that probably we're all living together. Like I'm living with Liam and there's a house of four down beside me and another house of four um, beside them. So, you know, we're kind of, we have to stay as much as we can in our bubble. Um, and I suppose that might be hard as, as a college, you know, there's other stuff might be going on, but we're, we're hundred percent focused on um, doing what we can on the pitch. And in terms of the season ahead, you're obviously, you know, we, we, we just spoke to uh, Michael O'Connor and stuff. And I was saying the Galway shells and Bray, uh, you know, are all favorites, but every year, UCD just seem to produce and they either win it or they get promoted and, and how how are you focused for the season? It, it, it's like any from when I used to play against UCD, it was like there was no fear. Uh, you just go, you, you're just like uh, 11 lads on the pitch enjoying the game of football and it used to be so hard. So in terms of that, do you set yourself targets or do they just say, look, we're going to have a good year or are you aiming to, you know, get promoted? Yeah, and I suppose just picking up from last year, you know, it was a very disappointing year in the end. You know, I thought on, on the whole we were we um we improved as much as the team um, you know, with our new manager coming in and we moved to a three five two, which I think caused a lot of teams a lot of problems. And then unfortunately in the playoffs against Longford, luck on another day, we we win the game and we might be saying that we're the team that going up, but we gotta take that and learn from it. And look, this year I think it's not just us. I think everyone knows the standard in the league has um, massively improved with all the players coming in, especially with Shelburne and um, Galway, probably pumping a bit of money into themselves. And, you know, maybe players that would have been renowned for playing in the in the Premier Division coming down. So, well, look, we, we look at that as a positive. Look, we want to be playing against the best players as we can and put it up to them and just kind of have performance after performance. And I think when we speak about when we get a performance, hopefully the result will look after itself. And look, we're we're not saying that we've a set goal on what we wanted to achieve, but we just want to get as high as up across the table and maybe surprise a few along the way. Yeah, I suppose we touched a little bit on career after football, and I suppose there's a load of different paths from UCD in terms of where you might end up. We've spoken about the Robbie Bensons and the Ro- and the Ronan Finns and the uh, Conan Burns of this world who go on to have careers in 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 the league there's others who don't play again really much after after they, they graduate and um, i suppose your family links as well you mentioned your brother played for ga your sister also played for the ladies football in, in in donegal but she's involved in a professional capacity with international sport as well uh what's the the plan for you is the the ideal to go get your degree and then look at maybe a professional career in the league or elsewhere yes i think that's definitely um I'm studying um, maths and biology teaching. So I think that's something that, you know, I can always have after, you know, when I retire or thing. But uh, no, definitely looking after UCD, I have another, what, nearly two years left of my course. And then after I'd be definitely looking to to go full time if that's here or wherever it'll take me. And then maybe even trying to get a bit of coaching on top of it too. Um, you know, I think that's the, the kind of things I need to be looking at. I know it's hard now maybe looking at teams because I know the underage but I think when you have the chance especially here when maybe taking a few teams and so that can only help you in your improvement as a player but obviously a coach maybe looking afterwards that that might be something as well but to answer your question yeah definitely I'd love to go back um, full time and hopefully that might be a thing that might pop up after. You might see even back at the showgrounds at some stage. I know you're always one of the best ones uh, in terms of interacting with the the younger fans. They were you were their fan favorite, uh, and you were always the first one over to them after games or summer camps or any of that sort of stuff. Uh, you seem to go down well, and I'm sure it's continuing up in UCD. Um, Jack, we've run out of time, unfortunately. That's it for this evening. Uh, thank you so much for having a chat with us, and I suppose the best looking cove on Friday on Saturday, a Saturday afternoon. Yeah. And the best luck for the rest of the season as well. Thanks, my lads. Chat to you soon. Best of luck, Jack. Thanks, Alan. Jack Keeney there, an absolute gentleman and one of my favourite characters 
within the league. I think we're going to see plenty more of him over the years, both in the UCD jersey and, as he said himself, maybe somewhere else down the line when his studies are finished. In terms of the fixtures this weekend, I suppose we might start, Alan, uh, with some of the games that are looking forward to this weekend. And, of course, the big TV game on Friday evening is the clash. It's one of our favourites. We love it every year. Shamrock Rovers and Dundalk. We just can't get enough of this game. Yeah, it's going to be, um, you know, Dundalk are wounded. Uh, Shamrock Rovers haven't played uh, in, in week two. So, uh, and obviously they're hurting from the from the President's Cup. So, um, it's going to be a tight one. I just feel Shamrock Rovers are nicked this. Um, I, I just think Dundalk are lacking a little bit of confidence at the minute. Um, they, it's always a big game. They'll be up for this game. They won't want uh, Shamrock Rovers to get one over on them. Um, but... I'm, I'm going to go for a Shamrock Rovers win. Yeah, no, we're not going to go through all the games because we don't really have the time on the show. We're trying to keep it uh, to just over the hour if we can. We don't want to be going on and on and on. We'll run through the other fixtures. Longford and Sligo is the early kickoff on Friday, quarter to six, live on Watch LOI. Uh, so Saturday afternoon or Saturday evening at 6 p.m., Drogheda United, Finn Harps, Waterford visit Derry and St. Patrick's Athletic make the journey across the city to Dalymount Park. Any of those games uh, hit your fancy at all? Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to the Pats and um, the Pats and, and, and Bowes game. That should be intriguing uh, to see how Bowes react. Also, the top of the top table toppers, Finn Harps versus uh, Drogheda. That's a uh, uh, one to, to watch. I, I fancy Finn Harps to, to maybe continue the role. And obviously, you know, you look at the the Longford and uh, Sligo Rovers game. It will be a good. I think that will be a good, good, very good game. Um, and then look at we're going to look at Derry and Waterford, uh, Derry and home. I think they'll get off up and running, but definitely the game of the weekend is Dundalk and Shamrock Rovers, but it's closely followed, I suppose, by uh, Bowes and Pats. Absolutely. In terms of the first division, then we have a full round of fixtures at four games on Friday night, one on Saturday at Lone Town and Galway, a nice local ish derby there for those two sides. Cabin Teeley host Cork. Shelburne make the, or Shelburne, sorry, will be hosting Bray Wanderers at Talca Park, while Wexford make the journey across the country to Treat United for their first home game back in the markets field. And Cove Ramblers is the venue for the game again with UCD. Uh, Jack Keeney, obviously, we, we alluded to that in that interview. Any of those games, which one would you be turning on now on Watch LOI to to catch up with uh, over the weekend? I suppose I'll, I'll be looking at the Atlone and Galway game, uh, being from Galway and all that. But uh, no, I'd be interested in see how Treaty and Wexford get on. It'll be, I, I you know, Treaty, new team in the league. Um, it'll be interesting to see both teams looking for their, their first win um, and I'd like to see what 3D are like I've kind of seen you know some of the other teams but I want to see what 3D are about and how Tommy Barrett has them playing Yeah no I watched their game against Bray at the weekend for me I think Shells and Bray two teams expected tipped to challenge for the title this year I think that's going to be an absolute cracker but then it'll probably end up something like the Galway game last week where it just peters out into a kind of a, a chess stalemate by the end of the 90 minutes Alan we've run out of time thank you very much for joining me as ever this week thank you so much also to our guest Stephen O'Donnell to Michael O'Connor and to Jack Keeney for filling us in on how their seasons are going so far uh, we'll probably see you in a week or two Alan back on the yeah, show yeah no problem yeah I'll be, I'll be around <laughs> Perfect. We talk to you. And thanks to everyone for watching and listening. Uh, you can catch us in all the usual spots, uh, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or on YouTube. You can actually watch the show. If you are listening to us, there is a, a video version as well. Or check out all of the stats, league tables, results, fixtures on finalwhistle.ie. Thanks very much to Alan. I'll be back again next week. Talk to you then.